We're so glad you're here. We believe in bringing in experts to inspire and to educate women so that they can live empowered, fulfilled, and successful lives. When women support women, we change the world. Here we go. You're going to love this program. So Nancy, I'm so excited. Our guest today is a nationally recognized cardiologist and has this incredible national platform on women's heart health. In fact, she's been recognized uh, nationally and she also earned the 2020 uh, award for Women's Day Red Dress Award. Big, big honor. Um, You know, our guest, Dr. Annabelle Santos Volgman, a professor of medicine and senior attending physician at Rush Medical College and Rush University Medical Center. She's also the medical director of the Rush Heart Center for Women and Chief of Academic Affairs for the Division of Cardiology. Annabelle, it's so wonderful to have you back in front of our Women's Forum community wearing your signature red clothing, which we're doing in honor of you to remind people that heart disease is still the number one killer of women. Thank you so much, Barbara. And thank you, Nancy, for having me here today. And it's an honor of women with heart disease and, uh, and to spread awareness that heart disease is still the number one uh, killer of American women. Where did so that myth you. come, Annabelle, that it was a man's disease? Well, unfortunately, when we were studying heart disease, we noticed that men were dying of heart disease at an earlier age than women. And so we all worried about the young men dying of heart disease. Um, Women tend to have heart disease later than men. Mm. About 10 years later, our estrogen or our premenopausal state probably protects us from having heart disease. Um, When I talk about Mm -hmm. heart disease, I'm I'm talking about coronary heart disease. Women get all kinds of heart heart disease that is not coronary artery disease at a younger age. But when it comes to heart attacks, men get it at a younger age. And I think people were worried about men dying suddenly and uh, Mm -hmm. women didn't tend to do that as much. But women... Are, we're dying of heart disease more than men in numbers since 1984, and we didn't worry about the women as much. And so the American Heart Association and the national health organizations like the NIH really got on board with trying to educate women and doctors about the risk of heart disease in women and men. Well, I know you do a lot to that end. So thank you so much, especially with the Women's Heart Center. Um, So we want to jump in. Uh, Our current Women's Forum theme, Annabelle, is designing and living your brilliant life. And uh, that is you personified. Uh, Can you tell me and Nancy, what has been the source of your courage to be so confident and to create such a big and brilliant life for yourself? Well, thank you so much. I would not say I have a brilliant life, but um, I have a happy life. I have very loving family and friends and a very supportive uh, husband who, you know, we don't always get along, but um, but in, in terms of his support of what I do, um, especially as a cardiologist and helping people and making sure that our family is safe, I think he's been the most amazing partner uh, in life. You know, I would uh, say that having somebody who is very loving and supportive has really helped me get through a lot of hard parts of my life. Um, and he's been with me since I was an intern, uh, which means that uh, after you graduate from medical school, you have an internship, and that's probably the hardest time for a doctor because you're on call all the time and you're taking care of a lot of patients and you, you don't know much yet. You're learning how to be a doctor. And he's been with me um, since then and he's just been incredibly supportive of the work that I do. That's fantastic. I mean, I totally understand and appreciate the importance of having that, uh, uh, you know, that 
partner right next to you. I, I'm curious, Annabelle, you know, as a cardiologist, you know, you're in a male dominated specialty, right? And so how do you help other women, both in medicine and outside of medicine, um, you know, kind of come into their power, own their power, be courageous and own their voices and find fulfillment in their lives? Thank you for that question, Nancy. I do a lot of mentorship and sponsorship of my fellows, my daughter, uh, my residents, my students. Um, and it's not just women. Um, I also mentor and sponsor men. But when it comes to finances, it's the women that need more help. They don't like to talk about money. They are afraid of money um, because when you're a doctor, all you care about is how to be a good doctor and how to care for people. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a taboo to talk about your salary and investing your money. And what I'm trying to teach them is independence. When you own your money, when you know what your money is doing, where you're investing your money, making sure that that hard earned money is working for you, then I think you have some feeling of independence and peace of mind mm -hmm. that you are um, supporting yourself and that you can be independent and not ever dependent on a man or a spouse or a partner. Um, I th think independent peace of mind. Yeah, and it's interesting because I hear what you're saying. You know, Barbara and I strongly believe that um, you know money is power, and 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 in in the way that it gives women the opportunity to make choices in their life. And uh, you know, I hear what you're saying that the importance of starting to have conversations early and claim your financial independence and not relinquish that power, um, you know, to somebody else, whether that's your spouse or an advisor or whoever. That, that having that voice and maintaining that power is really important. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Um, yeah. My mom uh, was uh, working for a, um, an investment banker. He she was a teacher in the Philippines. And when she came to the United States, she started working for an investment banker. And she started learning about what he was doing with wealthy people's money. And so she right. really learned how to make her money work for her. And so she was able to retire at 62 and did whatever she wanted. So I was, I definitely learned from her mm -hmm. about, sorry about that. I definitely learned from her about what to do um, with money and be financially independent. But I, I love uh, Annabelle, uh, your story, because you've really encouraged us to do presentations to your team members, to women and men, uh, especially women to step into their power and own their voice when it comes to money. But uh, you share your story as you beat this, that, you know, that found the table to them that, you know, you initially weren't focused on uh, financial issues, and it wasn't until your first maternity leave that you finally took the time to learn about investments. All right, true confessions. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of those women who didn't really want to talk about money or worry about money. I just thought, you know, you it'll just come. And uh, I noticed when I was an intern. Uh, that my male colleagues were saving their money. And I said, well, why do you have to save money? He goes, well, I'd like to have a house someday and uh, you know, pay for things. And I just didn't think of that. And it wasn't until, I mean, I could barely have enough money as an intern and resident and fellow. You don't earn enough money. You don't earn a lot of money. So there was no money to save, at least from my standpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he did it, but um, I just spent more money than I probably should have. But it wasn't until the dot-com boom when everyone was talking about the stock market. And I didn't even know what a stock was <laughs> at that point. And um, somebody shame me my husband shamed me into saying <laughs> um he said uh, well you don't you're 38 years old and you don't know what a stock does i said well 
don't know. I was taking care of my patients and learning about medicine. And so I decided, since I just had a baby, that I had maternity maternity leave and uh, three months to um, spend a little more time away from the hospital that I learned about the stock market and I became brave enough to invest in the stock market. And um, it's done very, very well since. And I'm so glad. And I actually um, did not know what to do with my uh, 403B, which is a 401k for nonprofits. And so I just asked my colleagues, so what should I invest it in? I didn't even know. So Mm -hmm. he said, oh, you know, I like to have safe investments. I I would do an annuity, which was earning like four to six percent. And the stock market, of course, I didn't know that at that time, was earning nine to 10 percent. I said, that's a big difference over over, you know, decades. So I decided when I learned about the stock market that I would invest. And and ever since then, I've really taken care of our investments. My husband, even, you know, um, we decide together what to invest in, but uh, he really trusts me with my money and sometimes his money too. That's great. Yeah, those communi- those conversations are really essential, right, for couples to have that true partnership. And uh, not everyone needs to be expert. You just need to be engaged and make sure you've got a good process to manage your Absolutely. resources. One of, one of my fellows, um, you know, probably said, oh, yeah, no, we, in- we invest our money. I was like, well, do you know what you're investing in? She said, uh, no, but my husband does. And I said, please. Please know what you're investing in, investing in, because you don't want to find out later in, you know, your years if something happened to him that he was probably investing in bonds or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, something that you would not be happy with. So I think I want to empower women. I want to empower my my younger um, mentees to learn about money and own um, own their money. I love that you do that because that it they probably think that you're going to focus on medicine, but now you're helping them focus on their own financial well-being. But as a mentor to them, uh, also as a cardiologist, uh, since it is still a male-dominated arena, um, how do you coach and inspire and support women that come to you that really need your advice and counsel? What do you find are some of the ways that you really step in to help them? So uh, like like we have done in the past, uh, we've had some financial people like your company come over to Rush and uh, teach us about how to invest money. And because I have some leadership positions in the national organizations, I do have um, a say in what we talk about. And I always Mm -hmm. emphasize finances. Um, People don't negotiate their salaries, um, especially women. Women don't negotiate their salaries or their benefits. And I empower them to talk about all those things because those are what makes people happy having that, um, that financial independence. And what are, I'm just curious, Annabelle, what are some of the recurring themes you're hearing from your colleagues as to, or, or just others in your circle or network around why they're not um, owning, you know, their power around their finances or just around their life in general? You know, is it lack of confidence? Is it just lack of resources, lack of direction? What are some of the things that you see? I, I think it's just lack of knowledge from, you know, your parents teach you a lot of things. And when parents don't teach their daughters about money, they'll teach their sons, but not their daughters about money. They grow up thinking that they don't need to know about it. And I think we need to change that. And so when my kids were growing up, I taught both my son and my daughter about finances. And uh, so my daughter um, does know about finances and she knows how to invest in um, her money. And so I'm really proud that she, she's gotten it. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of my fellows have not gotten it. And so we keep (laughs) telling them you need, they're, they're too busy. They're really too busy taking care of patients and they don't make it a priority. 
Well, I think a lot of people, a lot of women fall into that camp where we focus on everyone else uh, except for ourselves and what we need to manage for, that's part of self-care, right? To, to evaluate and monitor your finances so that you can ultimately create this life that you're envisioning to live beyond your work years. Yeah, yeah no, true. I, I have a short story that I can tell you when I have my um, nurses um, at my house in Michigan as a retreat, um, we talked, we started talking about um, in money. And I said, are you guys making sure that you're investing your money into a good retirement fund? And um, one of them was good. She said, yes, I think I, I know what I'm doing. I've invested my 403B in, in good stock funds. And one just started crying. She just started crying. And I said, I'm sorry, Is, are you okay? And she felt so bad that she had never invested any of her money into anything. She did not feel she could afford it. So she wasn't even investing. She wasn't even putting away what Rush was, was matching. And so, you know, like I said, let's, let's make this a learning um, point and we will help you. We will teach you how to make that happen. You need to have a budget and you cannot go over that budget uh, because you will not have enough money to put away for your retirement. I think she's one of those people that felt like she was just going to get married and her husband was going to take care of her. And she was already in her 40s. And so, you know, it was a, it was an eye opener for her. Yeah. Sounds like it was an aha moment. And, you know, one of the things that that story reminds me of is that we really need strong women like yourself continuing to lead the way and reinforce some of these key points. Um, you know, I'm going to shift gears for a moment, um, if you will, you know, Barbara, um, uh, mentioned a second ago, self-care and all of these just amazing positions and leadership roles that you hold in, um, you know, in throughout your career. I'm curious, how, how do you, how do you kind of decompress? How do you practice joy? Um, or so what I brings you joy, perhaps? My, my friends and family, my family first, of course, my, and my friends are just a joy to be with. I have a I have several wonderful friends that I just love to travel with. Um, one of them is an ob uh, at Northwestern, and, and we've been friends since college, and we just ended up in the same city, and we share our lives together. Our kids um, have grown up together, and I have another friend who has matching kids, and we have the same energy <laughs> and the same personality, and so we all get along so well. And so that just, you know, grounds um, our families mm -hmm. uh, to have friends mm -hmm. that support you, and uh, we know we can go to them if we need it. We don't have family here in Chicago, uh, and they don't either. So whenever we need anything, they are our family. So. It's comforting to have that. The other things that bring me joy are, of course, reading and um, uh, doing research. I love to do research, and um, it, it brings me joy to answer a question. I tend to think a lot about medicine and cardiology and what you know we can help our patients with. And uh, last year, um, several of my friends called me and asked about their their parents, they were in their 90s or late 80s, and, and they knew that I specialized in arrhythmias. And they asked me, you know, should we put them on anticoagulants, on blood thinners? And um, mm. I said, yes, um, but we need to make a document about this so that people are not so worried. And we want to make sure that this is the right thing. And so it took me a whole year, but I gathered a few experts on this and we wrote a paper that was just published on the management of atrial fibrillation mm -hmm. in people over the age of 75. And so that brings me joy, you know, mm -hmm. tackling a question in medicine that I can educate people about. That brings me a lot of joy to see, you know, the work that we do published and appreciated by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's so much value in that, right? And and so do you work a lot uh, with your the, the, the doctors you oversee to encourage them and to come brainstorm around different research projects? Oh, absolutely. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the vice chief of academic affairs, which makes me um, the, one of the person who's in charge of making sure that we have academic productivity. And so when COVID started, that's when I started as the vice chief. Um, I took that opportunity to gather everybody and rally everyone to do research and around this disease that we didn't know a lot about. And um, it's been an incredibly rewarding time for us at Rush because Rush is one of the best hospitals um, who tackled COVID or tackling COVID. Um, Mm -hmm. We just have been. Uh, a great resource for a lot of people. And uh, so our residents and fellows were hungry for knowledge. And so we gathered a lot of information from the databases and we've been writing abstracts and writing papers. And it's been incredibly rewarding for us to be able to do that and publish our work. And we're continuing to do that. And that brings us a lot of joy too. That's fantastic. And I presume some of the findings are beyond just the impacts of COVID, but just learning more and new things around uh, cardiology and heart issues? Absolutely. Um, Because a lot of the news, you'll hear statistics, you'll hear mortality data, but we are studying the nuances of whether women are doing better or worse than men. We're learning... Does diabetes or obesity or heart disease increase your mortality? So we are studying the nuances of who is really being affected by COVID. Mm -hmm. And what should women prioritize to maintain good, healthy heart, good heart health? So... It's not just about nutrition or physical activity. A lot of it is stress management. There's good stress and there's bad, toxic stress. So good stress is when you get empowered or you want to get a lot of energy to get something done. Um, You want to take a test. That's stressful. Mm -hmm. That's good stress. Um, So the right hormones come, but then it goes away. But then there's stress that doesn't go away and it keeps your blood pressure up, keeps your heart rate up, and your hormones start to really affect your body. So you need to examine the stresses in your life and whether it's toxic or good stress. And if it's toxic stress, try to get rid of it as much as possible. That's probably one of the most underappreciated risk factor for diseases um, such as heart disease and cancers and mo- and a lot of other diseases. You know, it's funny because uh, Barbara and I are such um, advocates of the saying, focus on what you can control and let go of the rest. And in terms of just getting rid of those, you know, toxic stressors, what are some of the modalities that you suggest women use? I mean, is, is it, you know, I did deep breathing this morning or meditation or physical, like what are the top kind of two or three things that you would suggest women um, employ to, to let go of some of that? And so they're not carrying it around. So exercise is probably one of the best stress relievers. Uh, it has a positive effect on so many things. It decreases mm-hmm. the stress hormones. It decreases your blood pressure, decreases your weight if you don't overeat. Um, uh, just be careful not to overexercise because you don't want to injure yourself. And then that you know leads to a lot of different problems. So just know your body and know your limits. Um, exercise is a great stress reliever. And I agree that meditation, deep breathing, I do transcendental meditation. Um, I learned how mm-hmm. to do it. It really, really helps me decompress and also become more creative. Um, When I'm doing meditation, I often think of things that I want to do. 
And, um, you know, of course, you're, you're supposed to not think during meditation, but <laughs> good, good creative um, thoughts come when you're trying to meditate. <laughs> That's funny. It's so true. Well, I, actually, I've use some different apps and tools and and they say not to get overwhelmed and beat yourself up for when your mind drifts. That's just natural and exactly. just try to bring it back, right? Right. right. Um, so I do have another question. If you ran the world, you kind of do, I think sometimes, Annabelle, <laughs> but if you really ran the world and That's had supreme power, <laughs> what's the first change you'd make? Like, what is the change? What change do you, would you love to see? Thank you for that question, which is very, very difficult because, you know, there's so many problems in the world. But I think that uh, one of the things that I wish for the world was for people to be more tolerant of each other. Um, There are so many wonderful cultures, different cultures that um, we can learn from. I travel a lot because I love to learn about different cultures, different countries. The world is, the earth is so beautiful. And uh, the cultures that have come out of these beautiful places in the world are are just really amazing. And if people just stop being so insecure about the, their power or what they have and open their minds to the beauty of different people, different cultures, I think they would be happier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I, and, and, you know, talking about, um, you know, just different cultures and different people um, who outside of medicine, who inspires you and why? Um. The str- I think a lot of there are a lot of strong women outside of medicine, um, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, who I happened to be on the same plane with just before she died. Um, oh my god! I was it was right before the pandemic, and um, I was traveling from New York City right after I got the award uh, for the red dress um, award, and uh, I just happened to be going to Washington D.C. and these big men um, and women were surrounding this tiny little old lady. And I said, I wonder who that is. And then I realized, oh my God, it's RBG. (laughs) And uh, I was just so thrilled. And um, her security guard sat right next to me. And I, before I knew she was RBG, I said, would you like me to sit on where she's sitting so you can sit together? She goes, oh no, no, she likes to sit by herself. And then I knew. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was somebody really important. <laughs> but, you know, she's one of our most amazing heroes. Um, she was a tiny little woman like myself, and she didn't let that stop her from doing anything. Um, so, yeah. you know, I just so admire these strong women that um, have have rallied to help other women and not just women. I mean, other people who have not been, um, who didn't have a voice. So I, I like, I really admire, um, those strong women that can do that. Well, um, and you know, actually thank you because in so many ways you actually help other women, especially cardiologists and other women in your circle really um, step up and own their voice and um, and really step into their power. You know, it, you impressed me so long ago when I expected you to focus on um, the women that you oversee at Rush uh, and that are in your team that you want to talk to them about medicine. And you were all about making sure that they were self-advocating, which means their compensation means investment investing their money and um, that they own that power. And uh, so uh, that's such an important message and something that I don't know many other doctors uh, Mm -hmm. make those same types of suggestions and priorities for for their team members. So thank you for that. Well, I'm happy to tell you, uh, I'm sure you know, because it's your company that's speaking to the next, for the next webinar, that the American Society of 
echocardiography women um, are doing. And I'm seeing more and more of these hap- these webinars happening. So I think we started something. I and think I'm so. I'm pleased about that. <laughs> Me too. So are we. Absolutely. And, you know, I keep seeing that uh, cardiologists are among the top um, earners in, in medicine. And so these women are earning a lot of money. Uh, and uh, even if they're earning 80% of the men's salaries, mm-hmm. it's still a lot of money. If, uh, you know, cardiologists are earning over $400,000 a year, and that's a lot of money that they should really learn about how to invest. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and by he- coaching them and helping them publish and helping them step up up and and negotiate better i think in encouraging them to do that you're helping them not be party to that traditional gap that we see uh between men and women so so thank you for helping to close that gap absolutely i'm trying one at a time one, <laughs> one of at my a time. For, yeah. one of my former fellows said dr volman you'd be so proud of me i negotiated my salary and i'm making more than my male par- partner i'm like good for you <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, That's one great. step at a time. <laughs> well, when we have fierce advocates like yourself out there, um, not just, you know, talking about cardiology and the importance of heart health, but also the importance of staying engaged in your finances. Uh, you know, one of the things that we see quite often um, in the medical profession is that, you know, physicians are so focused on patients and on teaching and on research and so on. And so we are just, you know, huge advocates of helping, you know, everyone, but especially women lift up their heads, you know, look out, you know, because as Barbara said, they focus outwardly rather than inwardly. And there's nothing more important because we can't take care of everybody else unless we take care of ourselves and um, getting them to focus, you know, on their finances and their financial freedom is just so essential. So cheers to you for what you're doing, Annabelle. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, It it does seem um, counterintuitive for doctors to be talking about money. And uh, we don't like to talk about money. We talk about taking care of patients. And, you know, when you are a top doctor, um, they don't care how much money you make. They want to know how well you take care of a patient. Mm -hmm. And that is first and foremost. Making sure that we're taking good care of our patients is definitely our life's work. But yeah. here are so much talk about burnout. And um, people are burning out not because they're tired, it's because there's just too much work to be done. And they're trying to make us do more than what we can. And so it's not that we're suffering because of ourselves, but because of the system. And mm. so we can't feel guilty about feeling burnt out, we have to solve this, this, the system. And part of that is that they feel that they can't take time off, um, that they can't take vacation um, because they don't have enough money. Well, I think that when people are starting to burn out, they have to take those vacations. They have to take time off for themselves. And, and that's where money comes in. And so it's all part of it, you know, that financial security gives you peace of mind so that you can take those vacations that you need and um, not feel burnt out. And you don't want a doctor who feels burnt out. They're not going to be as good a doctor to take care of you because they're just too tired and they can't think straight. So it's all, you know, important. Well, that's all about kind of the theme of the recharge of this, our podcast here. So we totally understand that. Yeah. And what we underscore is how we all need to pause and reinvest in ourselves because unless we do that, we can't take care of others. Right. I mean, we forget. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Is there anything we haven't really talked about, Annabelle, that you were hoping we'd have a conversation about today? Yeah, I guess. The biggest question is how long, you know, should we um, make sure that our money will be enough for uh, how 
for the rest of our lives? That's always a big question, right? And if you guys can can help us answer that, <laughs> I can tell you that most women are living till their 90s and men till their late 80s. So we have to make that money work for us so that we don't run out of money. Right. Well, you know, that's why um, when we do the modeling for our clients, it's so important that we look at longevity. And in some families, uh, you know, you might want to default to 100 years. I mean, there's so many people living so much longer. Most of our models go to the early 90s. But that's important to stress test your finances and project out whether they'll remain sufficient to support you throughout your lifetime. It's a really, that will help people reduce their stress. Mm -hmm. If instead of not paying attention to their finances, they'll look at their life plan and create a financial plan and see if there's a gap between what they want to do and how much they can afford to do. And then they can then manage that gap, hopefully, so that they can then support their lifestyle throughout their lifetime. That's really best practice. Yeah. It is. It's a great, great um, point because when you feel like there's enough financial stability in your life, you feel more peaceful in your life. And, and that decreases stress, which is great for your heart. So I know, all, all of just, this yeah. advice is good for the heart, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, great collaboration that way. <laughs> exactly. Well, as always, thank you so much for your time and your, uh, this conversation has brought just some new ideas, I know, for me and Nancy. So uh, we really appreciate uh, you being with us today. It's my pleasure, always. Thank you so much. <laughs>